Good evening, everyone. Thank you all so much for being here today. My name is Tina Onikoi. I am, it's such a pleasure to be here with you today on this. Uh, we've been working really hard to bring this to you today. Uh, this is a collaboration between Counselors for Social Justice and AMCD. I think Margarita, you can come on down and um, we can get this party started. Yeah, hi, my name is Margarita Martinez. I'm president-elect for AMCD, and I'm so glad that I was able to come in towards the tail end of supporting this wonderful webinar. There were other great people who were working on it. And I just swooped in the end and took all the glory. Can't be on video right now because I'm in another meeting, but thank you everyone for being here. Um, the video will be available afterwards, and if anything, you can send emails to communications at amcd.info or virtual at amcd.info. Thank you so much, everyone. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get started. And so this webinar series is Weaponizing White Feminism. And we're so blessed to have two incredible presenters here with you today. And I am going to do my very best to uh, introduce them. The first we have here is Dr. Ebony White. Uh, she is a licensed professional counselor, a national certified counselor, and an approved clinical supervisor. She's an assistant clinical professor in the Department of Counseling and Family Therapy and the program director of the Master in Addictions Counseling Program at Drexel University. Dr. White teaches a variety of courses such as multicultural counseling, cognitive behavioral counseling, and case management techniques through a social justice framework. As the executive director of the Center for Mastering and Refining Children's Unique Skills, Marcus, a nonprofit organization, she focuses on expanding developmental pathways for at promise adolescents in Trenton, New Jersey through counseling, mentoring, and tutoring. Clinically, she focuses primarily on issues that impact the relationships and functioning of African Americans, primarily women and teens. She also provides multicultural and mental health training for law enforcement, religious leaders, educators, and community members. Dr. Ebony is a master team steps trainer, a curriculum designed to improve the functioning of teams in healthcare settings. Although she primarily provides training for the, co for the College of Nursing and Health Professions at Drexel University, she recently trained health healthcare professionals internationally in Gombe State, Nigeria, using these techniques. She appeared on TVC News Nigeria, Nigeria in the house, for presentation on using effective communication strategies in healthcare settings to prevent fatalities as provided at the Nigeria Health Leadership Conference in April 2019. Dr. Ebony's research interests broadly focus on advocacy and social justice within the African American community. Specifically, she is interested in the impacts of individual and systemic trauma on the development and functioning of individuals and families within the African, within the African diaspora nationally and globally. She has done trauma-focused mental health work in Croic de Bouquet. Quite a bouquet. <laughs> Can you pronounce it for me? My apologies. Quite a bouquet. Thank you so much. And that's enough. You can stop reading it. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and, the, and honestly, the list goes on and on. So, so very accomplished. So we're so grateful to have you here with us today, Dr. Ebony White. Um, and so we have our another uh, fantastic presenter today, uh, Salum. Wallow Roberts is a doctoral candidate pursuing her PhD in counseling at Montclair State University. She has worked as an adjunct professor and a research fellow on a national and a National Science Foundation grant at Montclair State University. Ms. Wallow Roberts is currently an adjunct professor at Fairleigh Dickinson University. Her research interests are violence against women, gender equity, trauma, refugees, and the impact of acculturation multicultural counseling and the experiences of students of color. Before pursuing her PhD, 
Ms. Wallow Roberts served as the director of a county-wide rape crisis center for 10 years, where she provided counseling, advocacy, and other support services to survivors of sexual violence and worked with community partners to create trainings, programs, and other strategies to prevent sexual violence. She is a licensed professional counselor in the state of New Jersey, owner and therapist in private practice at Sankofa Counseling Services, LLC. Thank you so much for being here today. And today we welcome you, our, our thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. I was trying to get your attention saying, listen, you don't have to read the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be here all day. <laughs> all right. So, uh, Salim, do you want me to start sharing the PowerPoint now or did you want to say anything? Um, no, no. I think you can, you can start sharing. Okay. As we're getting started, please put your um, name and where you're from in the, the chat, where you're hailing from, and maybe if you're a student, a counselor, or a school counselor, or a counselor educator, if you can put that in the chat, that would be great. Yeah, or just a private citizen, <laughs> that too. <laughs> right. All right, so it says the host has disabled screen sharing, so if someone can give me that ability, that would be awesome. All right. Can folks see my screen? Salome, are you able to see the PowerPoint? I can see your screen, yes. Perfect. Um, on my other monitor, but yes. Perfect, perfect. All right. We had a lot of places in the house tonight. Shout out to all of my students from Drexel who, who've shown up as well. All right, so let's get started. Uh, you already heard our bios or, you know, portions of our bios, but today our presentation topic is Pure Snow, White Women and the Weaponization of White Feminism. <laughs> and so, we're, this is our agenda for today, and we're going to try to give everything adequate attention. Um, we know we only have less than an hour tonight, and so I believe Franny put in the chat to please use the Q&A function. And so if you have questions along the way, uh, please put your questions in the Q&A box so that we don't lose track of those. And then just if you're engaging with us, you can use the chat box. And again, um, I, I believe Franny put it again in the chat so that you know that. So if you have a specific question, please use the Q&A feature. Um, but when you're engaging with us, please feel free to use the chat. Uh, so let's get started. So we're gonna start with our stories and um, I'll go first, if that's okay with you, Saloon. Yes, uh, yes. And so this, this isn't our life stories, but we wanna kind of talk to you about how we came to the topic or this interest area. And so I am an African-American woman, a black woman, or, or I like to say an American African, and I was raised primarily by a village of women. And so um, mother, grandmother, great-grandmother, aunts, godmothers, they have been really integral in my um, life. But growing up here in the States, I mean, I'm saying that specifically because Saloom and I has, have uh, different experiences. And so growing up in the States as a Black woman, particularly as a young child growing up, I was always taught to be Black first. Um, and, and that was really important. Uh, but as we know, often, you know, Black women are in a really uh, odd place because Black issues tend to be about Black men and women's issues tend to be about white women. Um, and so even though I was always put, uh, I, I always put race first and still do in many ways, and we'll talk about that <laughs> um, later, it, you know, my, my specific or unique issues weren't really highlighted in that struggle or in that um, lens. And so I've really been for a long time coming to terms with the term feminism and how that sits and rests with me. And uh, really the impetus for a lot of my growth 
in this area came from a conversation, a six hour conversation that Saloom and I had on a drive from Massachusetts back home to New Jersey. We were debating um, the issue. There was an actor or there is an actor, Nate Parker, and he did this, he did this film around uh, about Nat Turner called The Birth of a Nation. And during the time that it was becoming popular and popularized, there was an issue that came about uh, from his record or incident that happened when he was in college in regards to an assault that he and a friend did on a white woman in college. And so Saloom and I engaged in a very deep conversation because, you know, my stance at the time was, you know, we were putting one issue before um, another. We were putting uh, we were putting gender before race. And so um, Saloom and I had a very tense and heated <laughs> conversation, six hour Quite conversation yeah. um, around that. And ever since then, you know, I've really been grappling with where, where I stand from this intersectional standpoint. Yeah, I, 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 I remember that conversation. But I think even before that, we had, we had so many conversations about that, right? About gender, which one is first. And, and for you, I think you always made it clear to me at the time that race was, was, came first for you. And, and I spoke that for me, gender came first. And the reason it did was because um, growing up, I grew up, you know, as you, as you mentioned in Liberia, um, West Africa, where everybody's black. So, so race was never an issue for me, but gender was, right? Um, a lot of the oppressions or marginalizations that I experienced were centered around my gender, you know, things I couldn't do. Um, girls are not supposed to do this. I love to play football or what we call soccer here. I love to play football in, um, in the streets with the boys. Well, I couldn't do that because girls are not supposed to do that. Or I, I love to, to be in the outdoors, and, you know, whether it's, going into the woods and, 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 and climbing trees and things like that. I was told that girls, you know, weren't supposed to do those things. And a lot of time, you know, this is what you're supposed to do, but how come the boys are doing that and I can't do it? And so I really struggle with that. Always wanting, always feeling like my gender was really holding me back. And so when I, um, when I moved to the States, I was very ripe for this idea of feminism. Um, and so I, I started to find and start to find feminist spaces or um, going to places that really spoke to that idea of, you know, what it means to be a woman and, 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 um, and equality and all of those things. And so, yeah, so this is how I, I, I come to the issue of feminism. And so because we're both solidly qualitative researchers, we felt it was really important to kind of give you our positionality um, yeah. and situate ourselves in the presentation today. And so we're, we're going to give you a definition or definitions of feminism, talk about the historical context, and then really start to get into the meat of our presentation. And we can't leave you all without leaving you with something to take with you. So we'll talk about implications and strategies as well. Oh yeah, so this is sort of an, an addition to to me and all of the you know the feminist um, spaces and things that I've been trying that I was involved in, and this was me at the at the Women March, or I should say the March on Washington, right? Because the the Women March was the first um, march that happened in Philadelphia many years ago, but um, which also became a topic of conversation. Where should this be called the Women's March? Because Black women had already done that so many years before. Um, but anyway, yes. Yeah, so this was me at the um, at the the march on DC, I should say. And so what is feminism? And so a really short and succinct definition is just a belief that men and women are equal and should have equal rights and opportunities. Uh, and I really like how Bell Hooks, and we'll hear a lot from her today, um, how, how Bell Hooks put it, that it's a movement to end sexism, sexist, sexist exploitation, and oppression. And so although she's not speaking to a specific gender, she's speaking to um, multiple identities. Um, so it's just the, the, the movement to end these things. Yeah. And um, I like I like this this definition also, which she which is much more holistic, and and it also speaks to not just feminism being sort of an idea, but really an action. And it says that 
Feminism is the advocacy of women's rights on the grounds of political, social, cultural, and economic equality to men. It maintains that the subjugation of women and their perceived inferiority is cultural, not biological. So really sort of takes on this holistic approach of feminism as just not being sort of an idea, but really um, the way of being. Or if you um, if you prefer Pat Robertson's um, de you know definition of feminism, which is that feminism encourages women to leave their husbands, kill their children, practice witchcraft, destroy capitalism, and become lesbians. And we thought it was important to include that because this is a widely held belief still today. Yes. But I think I, I, I like bell hooks definition, which, which really talks about intersectionality, really, and looking at all of those identities. And so bell hooks maintains that feminism is not simply a struggle. I'm sorry. A struggle to end male chauvinism or a movement to ensure that women have equal rights with men. It is a commitment to eradicating the ideology of domination that permeates Western culture on various levels, sex, race, class, to name a few, and a commitment to reorganizing U.S. society so that the self-development of people can take precedence over imperialism, economic expansion, and material desires. And so, and so in this definition, feminism really is a call to, it's a call to arms. It's really about interrogating all of those intersectional um, oppressions that we hold, right? This idea of domination. It's not just about, you know, what women experience, but what all of those marginalized um, people experience. And so feminism is a call to everybody. Let's, you know, let's, let's work on this oppression thing. So we wanted, we, we, we have these names and we wanted to see like what these names meant for, for our audience. So um, if you recognize any of these names, um, say something in the chat box or- Yeah, so we really want you to be involved. So in the chat, if you can just list how many of these names you know, like when you see, you, how many people do you know? And I'll look at the chat. And if it's none, put none. Okay. <laughs> I see an eight-ish. Yeah, the names, <laughs> uh, eight-ish. That's really good. I see someone had 10 or so. Mm -hmm. Good. So nines. Okay. Oh, 12. That's very she's, showing, she's showing off. Our, our showing off. <laughs> that would be Dr. Glosso, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not surprised she knows 12. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I have an additional question for you. She's being modest about that 12. Maybe. And I also um, have an additional question. The people, those of you who maybe know less, how many of those are people of color? I want you to ask yourself that question as well. And you don't have to put that in the chat, but really just thinking about that. Those are of the names, you know, whether it's one name, two, three, four, five, you know, how many of those names are people of color? Did you want to ask them before we um, move on? No, I mean, the, the, the purpose of really this, this exercise is, is exactly the question you asked, right? That we, and I think a lot of people, if we were to ask this question and were to answer, you know, I see the numbers, but if we were saying names, it would probably be names like, you know, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony and um, names such as those. And I think the, the lesser known name or the, their counterparts, right, or contemporaries are lesser known. And so that begs the question is why is it that we know, say, for example, Susan B. Anthony, but we don't know Maria Stewart, for example. But yeah, certainly. Who's an OG. <laughs> an OG, who, yeah. right, who was, who was out there speaking even before Seneca Falls, right, mm -hmm. and now women's yeah. rights. Um, so, but yeah, so that is the, the purpose of this, the exercise. Okay, it's not progressing. There we go. 
So I'll speak to this um, really briefly. And then, of course, I want you to, to chime in. But I think about, you know, one of the names on the list we just showed you was Sojourner Truth. And she did a speech, um, Ain't I... Into I, into I a woman. And it's so interesting how she she gave this, you know, wonderful speech talking about how, you know, and we'll we'll talk more about this as we progress, but how she was treated differently than white women because of her race. Um, right. She's like, nobody's helping me out of carriages, nobody's doing this, and ain't I a woman? And she gave this speech and really talking about that really helped the women's suffrage movement as well yet that movement didn't benefit black women and so there's a i just want to kind of foreshadow our presentation um, and talk about how many times there are women of color who put in the work and don't get the benefit of that work um, they don't get recognized for that work and so <clears throat> it comes in waves as and i will say this there is some pushback um in regards to talking about feminism in waves because you know some feminists would say Talking about it in waves means that it's not consistent. It's not an ongoing struggle. Uh, however, you know, for us to break it down for you today, we will talk about it, how it um, has been documented in waves. And so the first wave, you know, Saloon, you just mentioned Seneca Falls Convention, uh, which culminated in the right to vote. But however, even before that, 1833, so this is even before the end of slavery, um, intersectional feminism was being addressed by Maria Stewart. And she had a really powerful, I should have included it here, she had a really powerful speech um, in 1833 talking about her experiences and um, really speaking to what it was like being um, a Black woman, talking about um, even the fighting for education and fighting for doing more than just sharecropping and things of that, uh, of that nature. And so it's important to know that even though we're saying that the first um, wave began in 1848, there was work, there were women, there were Black women doing this work prior to that that wasn't recognized. Did you want to add anything before I moved on? No, okay. Okay, and then the second wave, 1960s to the present, and I think this is the, the wave that people are most familiar with, um, and so women's cultural and political inequalities are in inextricably linked Right. And so really this wave was encouraging women to understand the aspects of their personal lives as deeply politicized and as reflecting sexist patriarchal power structures. And so some of these names were on the um, slide prior to this, Betty Friedan, Gloria Steinem. Um, however, Dorothy Pittman Hughes, who was really working um, side by side with Gloria Steinem, she's a lesser, a lesser known name, even though she was such a giant, such a warrior. Um, a warrior in the field. And I also remember, and we'll talk about Audre Lorde too, but she was, um, she was talking about how her self-care, like really leaning into her self-care as a woman was a, was not only self-preservation, but was an act of political warfare. And so really looking at our experiences as um, deeply politicized. And then the third wave is considered the 90s to the present. And uh, the, the, it distinguished itself from the 60s um, in regards to sexuality. And so challenging female heterosexuality and seeing it as a means of female empowerment. So um, this essential notion of femininity or what is good uh, or not good for, for women was challenging. Also, we wanted, it's attempting, I, I don't think it's doing it well, but attempting to honor it intersectional feminism. And so we want to talk about how Audre, uh, how warrior Audre Lorde and others were speaking to intersectional feminism well before this. See 1833 Maria Stewart, right, who was speaking to intersectional feminism as well. Yeah. And the other piece that I wanted to add to that, Ebony, is also um, when we talk about the second wave and, and, and it's coming about, you know, with Bet Betty Friedan and talking about the feminine mystique, this, you know, landmark research that she did, which was speaking to um, women's experiences. All of those experiences that she was talking about was really about white women, right? And, and, and white women having this problem that has no name was what it was, it was called at the time. And so her research was based on this idea where women were feeling like there's got to be a lot more to my life than just staying at home and taking care of, you know, or of, the, of the house and things like that. But the, the, the interesting piece to that is that that was 
mostly not black women's experience, right? Because most black women were, had to be out there in the field, you know, working, not in the field, but out working and working outside of the home. And so a lot of the, um, the pushback about this wave is that, well, we, you know, it's great that, that these women were feeling dissatisfied with their life or wanting something lot larger and having this existential questioning, but for black women, we were, we were trying to survive. <laughs> we were trying to, to live and make ends meet. And we were never given that choice or even that option to stay at home because ever since we were brought here, we have been working. Um, and so that has not only been an expectation, but in many ways, it's been a requirement. And so white femininity versus feminism. Feminism, yeah, I said that right. <laughs> and this is really important for us to distinguish because even though they are um, parallel or um, intertwined in many ways, they're also different. And so it was important for us to make that distinct distinction. And so femininity are those characteristics, traits, and behaviors attributed to women and girls. And so just think about some of those adjectives we use to describe girls or even babies when they're born, like, oh, so pretty. Oh, look at her hair. She's so gentle and stuff, right? All of those um, traits and characteristics. Um, it's often uh, lacking fluidity. So it is static. It's not changing. And it's mostly so socially constructed. And so, so, you know, talking about, I believe, you know, there are some biological differences between men and women um, as well, but the idea of femininity is mostly social construct, socially constructed, and it's also culturally laden, and I don't know if someone wants to chime in here, but it's important to know that um, femininity is different based off of where you're from, uh, the culture that you belong to, maybe even the religious beliefs um, that you hold. Right. Um, certainly, uh, the things that may be, you know, considered feminine in, in one culture certainly is not the same, you know, in, in, in different cultures, right? So I think femin I think femininity in that sense is it sort of travels or or doesn't travel but but is is localized so that um but but in this context that we're talking about the in the United States, for example, Western culture, right? The idea of femininity is really wrapped around white women and and, and all of those features and characteristics but it assumes that it's applicable to all women when it's not and 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 the thing about that then is that it becomes the standard all women are held to and by which all women are judged right so when you're not um adhering to these uh, traits and characteristics that are considered feminine then then essentially you're not you know you're not really a real woman yeah, and, and not even that. And so something just came up as you were speaking, and we can speak to it later, but just to, you know, put it in our minds. But not just if you're not living up to that standard, but if you're never even given that standard um, in the first place, right? And so what is seen as a woman has never been applicable um, to you. What does that mean? As well, going back to uh, Sojourner Truth's um, speech, it's almost as if, even if I am, for example, even if I am behaving in a way that is seen as the standard for all women, because it's me behaving in that way, it's pathologized, it's stigmatized, it's judged um, poorly. So that's what's coming up for me. And then this is, oh, did I miss one? Nope, this is you. Right. Oh, I don't see that. Okay, um, what is the piece here? Uh, so it's talking about issues, um, quality of focus, um, and all the experiences that we talk about that affect women or issues that impact white women, right? Which we mm -hmm. talked about that. So for example, even when we talk about the salaries or people are making examples and they say women, women make 79 cents on a dollar and really that's not women, right? That's, or it's not all women, it's, it's white women, right? But that also has become the standard when we talk about, when we're talking about oppression in, 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 in the workplace and things like that. Um, we're talking about maternal health. The issues, there's a huge disparity between how black women are treated around maternal health, right? We know that black women have a very high risk of um, you know, mortality and things uh, around their reproductive health 
than compared to white women. So all of those, all of those issues, for example. Um, the, other, the other piece that, that we talked about earlier, which was this episode of um, Blackish, right? Which was um, in, in this episode, and, and I think it, it goes back to what you, you were talking, Ebony, about why it was so difficult for you to draw into, into the feminist movement to work with, 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 with white feminists. And this was because you felt like this whole movement was co-opted, right? And so there's this really scene, there's this scene in Blackish, which is this um, TV show where um, Rainbow is, is, is trying to work with, um, with, some, with some women in her community around you know, feminist or gender issues, right? And every time she would try to speak on something, she would get shut down. And she would get shut down because the, the women were, were, were thinking that her issues were trying to focus a little bit more on race than on, and then on gender. And for her, it was difficult to separate the two, right? That there was, it was hard to tease apart the issues that affected her based on her gender or her race. And so that for me was just one of the examples of how, you know, um, this movement, how, and all of the things that, that are considered white feminism or feminism is really, um, really doesn't appeal to, to everyone. I don't know if you, you wanted to add something to that, Ebony. I see you have that, that, that look on your face. No, absolutely, absolutely. Right. Um, and and we we talk here about misogyn misogynoir, which is really about this this concept of idea of you know the the hate that black women receive specifically because of their because of their race, right? Um, and so um, a lot of times these these things happen, and we're looking to hear something um, from from white women, and a lot of times there's a silence, right? So. Um, Black women always, instead of being the ones to come forward and, and, and speak on behalf of each other or speak on behalf of one another. And, and um, I, I, in, I include this, this quote here from Rachel Cargo, who, who does a lot of work around this thing, where she said, if the goal of your feminism is to get equal power with white men, you're going to have to oppress a bunch of people. And so this idea of, well, whose side are you on or what side are you on? Pick a side, right? If you that if the idea is about um, full equality for all women, and then you need to make that stance, right? But if not, and you're choosing, you know, the sides of the men because you want to be like white men rather than because you want all women to be free. I think I see something about question. Yeah, we, I mean, we can save it to the end unless you want to address it now. No, no, that's fine. Okay. And so it was really important for me to do this juxtaposition um, and, you know, Saloon really expanded it for me. And we wanted to have a disclaimer. We don't want anyone to feel like they're missing from this equation. Um, however, historically, things have been very black and white, and it's such a stark contrast here. Um, but we are not excluding um, women of color. Uh, other women of color as well. But if you think about the characteristics that are um, associated with white women versus black women, I want you to look at this slide um, and really talk about what comes up for you. Um, and so white women are seen as the epitome of femininity, right? Whereas black women are seen as the antithesis of femininity. Salome? Yeah, and, um, and, and, and white women are seen as, as pure and, um, and, and innocent, and, um, and Black women are seen at, as all-knowing and, and mature beyond years. And, but, but the other piece of that is they're seen as all-knowing and mature beyond years, but not, but not in, the term, in the sense of their wisdom, right? But really about um, knowing, knowing more than, than your, your age in terms of young girls, right? So, so this piece was really speaking to um, a, a survey that was done um, where a lot of people were, were asked about images of, of, of young black girls and images of white girls. And um, the images of the young black girls, the descriptors that they gave were that, oh yeah, she looks older and she looks mature and she, and all of these things when really, and then for the, for the white girls, it was, oh yeah, she looks really sweet and innocent and pure and all of those things. So. So yeah, so juxtaposing those those um, 
characteristics is interesting to see. Yeah, absolutely. I wanted to show that Black women also, I think this is an important one, uh, are seen as lecherous and hypersexual. Um, and we know that Black girls are sexualized um, very, very young, um, even though research shows again and again that Black women, white women don't engage in sexual behaviors at different rates. They, you know, they, they engage in behaviors at the same rate. However, Black women are seen as hypersexual. White women are seen as innocent, soft, and demure. And Black women are seen as hard, brash, strong, and independent. Um, whereas white women are seen as needing support. And to me, that's a really Im Im important one. You know, um, th the difference between if you're seen as someone who needs support versus if you're seen as someone who's independent, right? And, and, and the differences in the way that people are engaging with you based off of that belief, right? right. You don't know how to do this. You should be better. Oh, I didn't know you needed help. You know, you didn't say anything. <laughs> right. That you are in that your, your, your independence also isn't about that you're independent and you have, you know, you can, you're, in, you're industrious or you're creative, but really the independence is, um, you can do this yourself. You really don't need me. You know, I don't need to support you. Um, whereas on the other end, on the other side, when, when the support is giving, it's like, you need the support, but at the same time, yes, you can be, you can you can have great ideas and be creative and all of those things. Absolutely. And then we see, you know, white women are deserving of grace, protected, and typically play the main character, whereas black women are unprotected, um, must fend for themselves, uh, loud, angry, emasculatory, and um, is often plays the sidekick. Right. But the love interest, right? So, so the love interest and all of that, even in, in in movies and media, right? You see, is um, it's it's seldom that the black woman is this the love interest of the center. Um, she's always the, the the funny, the cute side chick, um, um, sidekick, I should say, mm -hmm. side chick. That's <laughs> well, that's, a, that's a whole other topic, but yeah. yeah. All right, and so I wanted this included in here. So we're talking, the, the, the brunt of this presentation is about the weaponization of white femininity. And so this is, Salum knows more about the slut walk than I do, so um, I will let her talk about this picture um, and we can then go through the bullet points. Yeah, so um, part of my, you know, my, my feminist endeavors and ventures were also attending slot walks. Um, and, and, and so the, for those of you who, who, who aren't familiar with the slot walk, slot walk um, came about because, um, you know, in, in this woman in Canada, um, that basically uh, this law enforcement uh, officer was given a, a, a training and he, and he talked about how that um, if a woman, you know, doesn't want to be raped, then she really should not dress a certain way. So the implication was that when they were really asking for, 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 for sexual assault when they dress a certain way. And so what then happened was that the students got really offended by this discussion and decided to, sta to stage a protest, which then became um, a movement um, about the um, about the women's autonomy over their bodies and about you know is it safe to 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 walk the streets or can I be safe in the streets or wherever the streets became the whatever places that women were but so this is really an expression of of the the idea of what it means to be you know to be oppressed as a based on your gender and and this woman um decided that she was you know basically was going to express how oppress how oppressive it, it is to be a woman she said woman is nigger of the world um but even that piece um really takes away and and really doesn't you know the idea of using that offensive word, right, to describe the, the idea of your gender was another thing without thinking what that would mean to Black women. And so there was a lot of things. Of course, this, this here is based on um, uh, Yoko Ono's um, song many years ago, but even so, this young woman decided to, um, to take that up. But I know you had a lot of feelings about that, Ebony. Yeah, a lot of feelings because not only, so basically what she's saying is, again, and, and talking about me coming to this, this term feminist or even um, deciding whether I want to own it or not, um, but this woman is basically saying, 
that black women aren't women. Because if they were, then that term would never even be on the sign because they already are referred to in that way. And, and then on top of that, she is, um, while trying to highlight her oppression, she mm -hmm. is being um, very violent toward black people and black women, right? And so to me, this is not a sign of protest. This is an act of violence. And, and, and it, uh, it, she used her femininity, her white femininity as a weapon um, in, in, in this case. And so we already talked about, you know, media portrayals or love stories and how you seldom see black women centered and that white women are, um, are markers of beauty. But I also want to talk about how white women have used what it, their white woman is um, as, as a weapon. And so some examples of this, and we can go back to the other bullet points, but some, some examples of this um, was Rosewood. And I don't know how many people um, know about this town that was predominantly Black that was essentially burnt down in mass and the people were massacred because this white man's white wife, um, her neighbor told the husband that she was screaming and uh, that she was raped by a Black man. And the wife said, no, she wasn't. Um, but even so, just the idea to them was abhorrent enough that they decided to take up arms. KKK came from different nearby towns and they murdered men, women, and children um, because they were protecting this uh, woman's honor. Um, or even Amy Cooper, which was recently, this happened um, last year in Central Park in New York, where she was out walking her dog in a bird watching area is where you're supposed to leash your dog. And Christian Cooper, who's an avid bird watcher, he asked her to leash her dog. And um, because she was, I guess, upset that he asked her to follow the rules, she called the cops. She called 911 on him. And she proceeded to scream hysterically and said that um, an African American man, a black man, um, was was attacking her, was assaulting her, even though he was nowhere near her. But I thought it was interesting to watch her go into hysterics, even though she was not being threatened at all. And it's, and I believe it's because she knew the power of her being a white woman and that she knew that she's seen as innocent and pure and needing protection. And she knew how um, black men are seen and she, she would be able to throw her identity around to um, get the result that she wanted. And I believe she wanted him to get hurt that day. I believe that what happened to George Floyd could have happened to Christian Cooper all because um, Amy weaponized her, her femininity. I guarantee you that a black woman would never have been able to, to do that or get away with that. Right. Well, because she's gotten from the society that whiteness is currency, right? That she can use that to purchase anything she wants, any kind of feelings that she wants to engender in, in society, she can use that currency. So in that moment, it was this black man is threatening my sense of, you know, doing whatever the whatever the hell I want to do, and how dare you do that, right? So I have this currency that I'm going to use to buy what I can. And, and, and in, this, in that instance, what she was buying was, was fear. She really wanted to scare him, and she wanted to use that fear to put him in his place. And, and, and right, so speaking of that weaponization. Um, right, and so, I mean, I don't know if you want to talk about it, because we were going to talk about it. Someone put in the chat Emmett Till. Yes, Emmett Till. Yeah. You want to speak to that? Sure, absolutely. And this was a child, 14-year-old um, young man who was accused of whistling or even flirting with a white woman. And he was brutally beaten and, and murdered just um, for that, <laughs> for, for, for that act. And so just thinking about how embedded this idea of the purity of white women is and how it has been used as a weapon for a, a long time against um, people of color.
And so what are the implications of this, right? And so um, we use examples from the media, we use examples that happened, you know, like you know, the Amy Cooper example, historical examples, but we also want to highlight that this happens in our classrooms, this happened in our clinical spaces, this happens in our academic institutions, this happens in our community organizations, right? And so here are some of the implications. So do you want to start? Right, so part of that is that if we're going to speak, we better speak intelligently and eloquently or else we're dismissed, right? Immediately, it's um, there isn't a space for, for, for making mistakes. It's like, you, you better be on point. Um, or, right, we always have to be on point because there is an audience waiting, right, to pounce on that. And so it's like you have to be brilliant all the time. There is no, no, no opportunity for that. And the emotional toll to that is that Black women feel isolated, frustrated, dumped on, right, feeling like the shit of the world. Um, don't feel like we can trust other people to take care of our mental health, that few Black women when we think about even in our field, right, as counselors, we know that um, the, the number of, of percentage of Black women as compared to white women is huge, there's a huge difference. Um, and so all of those feelings of isolation and feeling like, you know, does it matter? Do I matter? And that also, you know, adds up to this um, imposter syndrome, right? Do I belong here? Am I enough? Can I hold this space I've been given? What if my mistakes impact other people and other women or other Black women? Um, so it, it really has serious um, counseling implications and educational implications, as you mentioned, um, Ebony, in the classrooms and, and, and those spaces where oftentimes um, Black women feel like they have to really hold back and not express themselves because um, they're afraid of all of the labels that we talked about earlier, um, what that would mean for them and what that would mean for other Black people. So before we move to the end of our presentation, I would like to offer an example of this exact thing happening to me. And so when I was in my PhD program, Salim and I were in a class together, um, and I think in that class, it was just just, just uh, you and I, I think, um, in that class, people of color in that class. And, you know, it was no noticeable to Salum and I that every time I would say something, I would get different reactions from the white women in the space, whether it was heavy sighing or turning their backs to me or things of that nature. And that was never commented on. However, um, one of my, you know, white peers made a statement in class one day and I rolled my eyes. Um, and I was called to, I'll say, the office for that and um, was basically said, you know, you can't roll your eyes and just talking about my way of being. And so that silencing uh, was very heavy because the very same behaviors that my peers were doing to me, I couldn't do. Mm -hmm. I couldn't do. And so the emotional toll, yes, I felt dumped on. I felt unseen. I felt devalued. I felt berated in many ways. And I asked my, myself those questions, like, do I even belong here? Is this worth it? Right? Because the toll was so heavy. You know, I felt like my spirit was being breaking. Like, is it worth it for me to con continue here if I can't express um, myself? And what was happening is, you know, for the teacher, uh, you know, the, uh, the white woman teacher, if another white woman was engaging in behaviors, that's a language that she knows that she's familiar with. But again, I didn't have the privilege of exhibiting those same behaviors. They were seen as violent or angry or, or, or brash because of my embodiment. Yeah. And so here are some strategies. So as counselors, and this is all counselors, it's not just for white counselors, but certainly for white counselors as well. Um, state your position, right? So we talk about broaching a lot in the counseling field. It's important that you are the person to bring up race, that you are the person to bring up what that means, that you are the person to offer that space and to hold that space to talk about um, whatever issues the client may feel, you know, arises. And often, you know, oftentimes in the counseling spaces, clients can be apprehensive or nervous or, or, or many um, various emotions. And so you can't leave it up to the client to tell you how they're feeling about the, the racial dynamic. And so really leaving that space, not just in the first session, but throughout to have those discussions around race and how race is impacting um, the, the sessions. 
always engage in self-reflection regarding the space that you hold, right? Um, how are you showing up and what is it about your identities and, and your, how your identities are holding that space um, as well, interrogating yourself. Why are you having the hunches that you're having about this client? Are they different based on you know, the race of the client? Like, do you notice a trend with how you are diagnosing or how you are viewing or how you are conceptualizing your clients of color versus your white clients? It's important to always acknowledge the power differential in the room, no matter how many times we say in the counseling field, you know, in, in our sessions with clients, listen, we are equals. I might be an expert in the field, but you are an expert on your life. There's still a power differential there, not just because of the role, but when you add race to it, that's even more power that needs to be acknowledged honored and discussed in process. And so it's important to make room. When Saloom and I were preparing for this presentation, she made this statement and I had to write it down because I just thought it was such an amazing quote. And so she said, you have taken up all of this space and held all of the oxygen in the room that I can't breathe. Yeah. And I know that many people, you know, have felt that way. And so it's important that as, I mean, think, putting on your counseling, Hat, that's that's really heavy. That's really heavy. Even going back to what you said earlier, Saloom, around how issues around women have really been issues around white women. It's taken up all the oxygen in the room. Right. Well, yeah. And when when I was talking about that, when I made that statement to you that I was talking about was I was thinking back to all of those spaces that I have been in, those feminist spaces where I've been in, where um, the conversations were always were supposed to be about women, but it always seemed to be about white women's experiences. Whether it was, you know, what else it was in even in community grassroots movements talking about feminist issues always seemed to be around that. And so they, there always seemed to be this idea of, well, when do I get to, <laughs> to speak? There's not enough air here. You're taking everything up. Um, and so that was sort of the, the, the feeling that I was having when I talked about that. Um, the other thing that we were, we were talking about as, you know, and you, and you talked a little bit about that Ebony's counseling students, some of the strategies is allowing, this, allowing fellow students to have the space of voice that is not representative of their group. And I know we talked about this a lot, but oftentimes, you know, that, that burden that's placed on what are, is black students or black women to speak about that experience as a group experience, right? When sometimes it's just about me. And so, how to 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 make space and allow them to do so without making it the, about the the group even though sometimes they can speak for the group experience when they're experiencing you know marginalization or oppression but certainly it can be about the individual also um and then honoring fellow students lived experiences and that piece i was thinking about you know, facilitating this conversation in classrooms, right? For example, your experience you talk about and how it became about, you know, this student against this student, rather than having the students really talk to each other and have conversations about each other lived experiences, right? So while one student might be like, ah, and you're rolling your eye, but really calling attention to that in the moment and say, I see both of you are here and having some kind of feeling and expression about this. What is that about? Let's talk about that, right? right? Rather than, than doing so, those are the responsibilities that, that I think counselor um, educators have to make that for, for counseling students. Um, resisting the urge to be defensive, and this goes both ways, right? Resisting the urge to be defensive, both as as students, but also as instructors. That when 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 um, black students or black women again question the uh, the pedagogy or whatever is happening in the, in the space, and not to be defensive, but really to say, "Ha, huh, what's going on here? You know, what is it that I'm doing that perhaps you know we can can be a conversation." Um, Pay attention to how you maybe play into or acting out femininity tropes, right? Um, again, that whole idea of why is she so loud? You know, this student, <laughs> this, this black student is loud and this one isn't and all of those things and, you know, that, that we often tend to fall back on, but really resisting the, uh, paying attention to that. And for counselor educators, thinking about how do you, and this is all counselor educators, how do you respect the academic work of black and brown women, honor space and hear, 
right? And so what um, are you including in your syllabi? What conversations are you having within your classroom? Who are you crediting um, with movements and, and with work? What theories are you promoting? Um, also give black women the latitude to make mistakes. Um, because oftentimes, you know, as Saloom said in the beginning, we, we, we're not giving that opportunity. We have to be on because if we're not, we're, we're pounced on. They're waiting for us to, to fail. Also, how do you engage with your black and brown students in your programs, right? Are you only engaging with them to criticize them? How are you supporting um, your students? Um, and then most importantly, resist oppressive pedagogical practices, right? What is your what, what is your t theory of teaching? How are you teaching? How, how do you see students learning? And is it a one size fit, fits all? Or are you being cognizant and conscious of the, the makeup of your classrooms and making sure you're teaching to everybody and not just one person and making it exhaustive? Right. And really, that means really interrogating even those theories that we teach, right, that have um, a lot of oppressive ideas within them. So even asking, I mean, certainly we have to teach, you know, psychoanalytic theories and all of those um, sort of um, canons of, of psychology that we have to teach, right? So that's fine. But really asking that questions, well, what does this mean? When this was written, you know, a bazillion years ago, did they have, you know, black and brown women in mind when they were when they were you know formulating these ideas and really ask those questions not present them as standard or as the norm yeah so we have a couple of questions in the chat we have one more slide and then we will um answer those questions so it was well we have two more slides but do you want to yeah, so, so again, I, was, um, I quoted Rachel Cargo earlier, here she is, and this was also um, over back at the, at the Women's March in, um, in, in DC, and it says, if you don't fight for all women, you fight for no women. Right. Um, and I, I thought that was a really that was a really powerful statement. And it goes back to the foundation of feminism. Right. This idea that, you know, we are that there's a struggle that all women have. Right. But and so if you say that, if you come from that stance, then it's necessary then that every issue that you take on has to be an issue about, you know, all women and how that impacts them. Um, and then, of course, this is protect black, Asian, Muslim, Latinx, disabled, trans, fat, poor women. So, again, there's that idea of in inclusivity, which feminism really is and has this foundation, I, I believe. So we wanted to to um, to end with this this um, poem, which um, by Lucille Clifton, which has always been sort of a, a rock and foundation for me, and it speaks to a lot of the experience of of Black women. Um, but I think it speaks also to to those women and people who find themselves in in places where you're alone or you feel like you have to create and start all over right, and make things of your own. So it says. Won't you celebrate with me what I have shaped into a kind of life I had no model born in Babylon, both non-white and woman. What did I see to be except myself? I made it up here on this bridge between starshine and clay, my one hand holding tight, my other hand come celebrate with me that every day something has tried to kill me and has failed and has failed and so we hope that you were able to get something out of this presentation i certainly did and i wanted to honor the two questions that we have in the chat and so saloon what is the difference between black feminism and womanism ah that's a good question so um womanism is more sort of a is when you think of a subsector of, of of black feminism, right? Womanism is a is, is is was created by Alice Walker, right? And it's this idea of really this inclusivity, which really doesn't um, talk to some. I think it was it was it was sort of questioning this idea of what what femininity is and what what feminism is through the lens of black through the lens of white women right but really coming and challenging that and say no womanism is really about this whole idea of of a woman and and 
sort of um, just distancing from the whole feminism. And black feminism is just, it, it's really, it's, it's about black women claiming those identities and those things that, those issues that impact them directly, right? Because they felt like the feminism or the general feminism that we were talking about, but really weren't talking about black women's experiences. Um, and so really, there isn't really a difference, a big difference between um, black feminism and womanism as much as it is at that, between what we call white feminism and black feminism. I, I, I don't know if that was clear, I hope so. Yes. And then secondly, I feel like this question is perfect for you too. What are your suggestions for engaging this work when working with biracial or multiracial young women who are negotiating their own racial identity, especially when the counter the counselor only identifies with one race, as it, as it relates to, to to feminism or just generally, what are your suggestions for engaging this work when working with biracial or multiracial young women? So, how do you um, speak to this and honor feminism when you're working with people who are multiracial? Right. Well, I think the intersectional approach really helps that and is and and really don't, they don't you know it depends on how they identify right so a, a, someone who's a multiracial person who's really claiming that multiracial identity might look at all of the different um oppressive pieces and benefits that that comes with that um i i, I think feminism doesn't really have to be separate from that that it does speak to all of that because whether you're a multiracial person or you're a biracial person if feminism is about the gender then we you can focus on the on those issues that impact you around gender and yes there might be nuances and differences to it as it as it pertains to race but again that is something that you can navigate i think um the feminism piece can can you know call to that absolutely and i don't know add something to that no I, <laughs> that, that was perfect and i don't know if it's okay to go over because we do have one more question um and it's from suny suny so thank you both so much for sharing your experiences do you have any recommendations about how to broach the issue of space and oxygen with white male and female doctoral students who mm -hmm. lack self-awareness about their attitudes towards women of color would you handle it yourself or ask a faculty member? So this is someone who's a student, um, and these are uh, your peers, I presume. And so listen, one of the, the greatest tools that I have is my counseling skills, and open questions have really helped me to um, not snap <laughs> oftentimes, but also get the result that I want because I found, and, and sometimes I still, you know, respond the way that I want to respond because I just feel like I need that for my spirit. But if I'm trying to get uh, people to increase their awareness, awareness, I typically ask questions that are open. And so I'll give you an example. I was at a restaurant and, you know, sitting minding my business and the owner of the restaurant came over, pointed in my face and said, who made her angry? And I literally was sitting at the table drinking water. And so my response to him was, what about me makes you think I'm angry? And immediately he's, oh, no, no, I never said, you know, and, and so this really puts the, the pressure back on the person to self-evaluate and depending on how I'm feeling that day, I apply pressure because I, I want an answer. Or sometimes I just leave it um, at that if, if I can see that they start to, you know, think or realize maybe what they have done. But also I, I know that um, I can't control the thoughts, feelings, and behaviors of other people. And so reaching that level of, of acceptance um, has been helpful too. Oh, and then lastly, if I can place someone in within the racial identity development model, then it's easier for me to, um, in, to engage with them, if that makes sense. Right, and I, I think to respond to this question also is, it, whose responsibility it is? I think it's. I think. I think number one is the uh, the faculty responsibility. The the professor's responsibility is to make sure that that space is an equal space, and and acknowledge that. And I think part of that is maybe stating that you know whether on your syllabus or in. And I know we have the usual um, statement that is included in the syllabus about you know gender, race, and everybody um, equal. But I think it's important to even speak that and make that clear that all of my students are going to be to have a space to speak 
or to or to 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 have ideas, right? That this is not going to be a, a male dominated space or a white male dominated space. Um, so I think that responsibility falls a great deal on, on the professor to do that. But certainly the student is is welcome to speak to that. And I really ask ask the the their fellow student if they feel comfortable. You know, what does it mean for you that you are constantly speaking and nobody else is able to do so? I, you know, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, as you said, putting those counseling um, skills to use and, and really turning it back on that, that student or that white male who's, who's really dominating the space. Uh, we have another question. <laughs> oh, Tina, should we end or can we answer, answer the last question? That's a question. Okay. So this question is, how do you address cognitive dissonance in people of color, women post-Trump era, post-Trump era? And this is the last question. So how do you address cognitive dissonance in people of, maybe women of color post-Trump era? If they, I hope I have that question right. I'm a little bit confused by it. Well, yeah, what is the cognitive dissonance around? Uh, I, I don't understand if women of color have cognitive dissonance post-Trump, right? Mm -hmm. So can you expand on that question, whoever it is that I asked that question? Or because we're out of time, um, if you want to email either of us, please feel free uh, to do so. I'm going to put my email in the chat and I'm going to invite Saloon to do the same. Um, and we will certainly get back to you um, and apologize if we didn't understand your question. Okay, I think that at this time, uh, we really just want to thank you both so much for your incredible wisdom. Um, I have learned so much from this presentation, and I definitely am going to check in with both of you to get more information on everything but uh, we really just want to thank you for coming to our uh, webinar presentation on weaponizing white feminism and um, we invite you to attend our future events coming up next will be uh, clinicians of color working with white clients specifically focused on microaggression um, and so you can look to expect that at the end of april um, there is a survey link in the chat. Please complete that if you are uh, hoping to receive some credit for attending, some continuing education credit for attending this webinar training. Again, this was brought to you by Counselors for Social Justice and AMCD. Uh, we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. Thank you for coming. Thank you.